Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, the third CADAP Biennial Review, from data, from data to Policy Implementation. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar and our Q&A session will be at the end of the event. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Jim Emke. Thank you very much, Michael. Again, welcome to everyone on behalf of USAID and AgriLinks. Really appreciate you all being here. We have a great webinar coming up on the third CADAP uh, Biennial Review from Data to Policy Action. We've got some great speakers lined up. And most of you attendees know as much or more about the Biennial Review as I do, but let me just take a minute to set the stage a little bit. In 2003, the African Union stood up the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, which made significant progress helping countries on their agricultural national investment plans in its first 10 years. The African Union reaffirmed CADAP, as it's called, in 2014 with the Malabo Declaration. The Malabo Declaration set an ambitious vision for African agriculturally-led development to unlock Africa's growth potential. And a really critical component of the Malabo Declaration was the seventh commitment on mutual accountability. Mutual accountability was talked about uh, very meaningfully in some of the high-level fora, such as the Paris Declaration, the Busan Partnership Agreement. And the tool of choice, there was the joint sector review. Well, think of the biennial review as a joint sector re review on steroids. It is cross-continental. It is done every two years. Countries report on over 260 separate indicators, and it is the global leading practice, leading best practice in mutual accountability. So we're going to hear about that today. We're going to hear about the improvements in data collection and data quality, and we're going to see how those data are being used by countries to inform their policy decisions and their investment decisions. So it's a great topic, and we have a great set of speakers. And finally, we are going to draw on a great, uh, great audience and a great set of attendees for your participation. Without further ado, may I present Alexius Butler, who is the Acting Deputy Assistant Administrator to USAID. And when we have not dragged her into Washington to act, she is the Development Diplomat in Residence at Morehouse College. Uh, Alexius, may I turn it over to you, please? Sure. Thank you so much, Jim, for that introduction. Distinguished guests, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. On behalf of USAID, I would like to express gratitude to the African Union Commission and our partners, Academia 2063 and PolicyLink, for hosting this important discussion on the CADAP Biennial Review, its implications and uptake, especially among otherwise marginalized communities. I am honored to be here to convey USAID's ongoing support for CADAP and the Biennial Review. As you all are well aware, ending global hunger and malnutrition remains one of the greatest challenges and opportunities of our time and is a top priority for USAID and the US government. At the same time, we recognize that beyond the devastating impacts of climate change, conflicts like Russia's invasion of Ukraine are also putting a strain on global food systems. And unfortunately, this strain is felt most acutely among those already at the margins. 
These vulnerable populations face the prospect of drought and heat-induced displacement, even as they vie with the unpredictable impact of our changing climate is having on food systems. Addressing the needs of the most vulnerable is why USAID maintains an abiding focus on partnership and inclusivity, all while strengthening local capacities in the countries where we work. Aligning our work to that of our local partners is part and parcel of our support for CADEP, an extraordinary framework for turning our shared vision for a hunger-free world into reality. Indeed, CADEP and its biannual review process, which we'll learn more about today, can be a model for USAID approaches globally. Beyond its innovative approach to data-driven development, the biannual review is a living example of USAID's sustained engagement with our partners. As our noted guest speakers and panelists will share today, USAID has been proud to engage with CADEP from its beginnings, working cooperatively with the African Union and country governments, supporting food security champions under programs like Africa Lead, and now strengthening agricultural policy systems through our policy link program and partnership with Academia 2063. Throughout, of course, we have anchored these partnerships in our commitment to the African Union Commission and the Africa-led development agenda it is champion. I am very happy to join Dr. Godfrey Bahigua and Dr. Simplice Nuala of the AUC, along with other longtime partners and friends with us today to celebrate this achievement, the CADA Biennial Review. Yet, as much as we celebrate that engagement, we must also recognize that Africa's progress towards the Malabo commitments remains a critical challenge. That is why building on the momentum generated by the recently released third annual biannual, sorry, my goodness, released, uh, recent release third biannual review report, which we'll be hearing more about today, USAID will continue supporting Africa-led policy frameworks. Key to this will be our ongoing investment in the people and institutions charged with implementing CADEP. USAID's support for CADEP reflects our longstanding and successful partnership with the AU, a partnership that has persisted through political transitions and, train and changing priorities, and also remains a testament to our shared commitment to Africa's progress. Now, we also recognize that not all countries have fully embraced the CADEP process, that some countries have not addressed weaknesses identified in the biennial review process, and that a lot of countries are behind schedule for achieving the Malabo commitments. So accelerating progress towards these commitments is among the highest priorities for USAID, and I know we share this priority with the AUC and its member states. We want to see countries using the biannual review data to inform inclusive evidence-based policy and investment decisions. The biannual review toolkit and events such as this webinar are means for a better understanding of the power of this framework for accountability. And that should be among you all. Thank you for your commitment to food security and nutrition in Africa and beyond. And thank you so much for the invitation to address this distinguished group. I'll turn it back over to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Alexius. Really appreciate uh, those remarks. We're now going to uh, have some help setting the scene. Uh, we were originally scheduled to have Dr. Godfrey Bahigua present this. Uh, I do not think that Dr. Bahigua is in attendance. He was called away um, for something else. And so I believe that we are now going to have Dr. Simplice Nuala to help us set the scene. Uh, set the scene. Dr. Nuala is the head of the Division for Agriculture and Food Security at the African Union's Department of Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy, and Sustainable Environment. Dr. Nuala. Thank you very much, James. Uh, may someone help me to share this uh, nice slide. So thank you very much, and good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning, depending on where you are joining us. And I want to thank uh, USAID and PolicyLink, AgriLink, for 
inviting us to share with the audience today the third Kade Biannual Review Report. But before I do that, and that will be the next slide, let me first share with you what CADEP is. CADEP is, and the next slide please, is the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program. This is the framework, the policy framework for agriculture and agriculture-led development of the continent. And its main objective is to reduce poverty and end hunger on the continent. Next slide, please. Now, today we are talking of the biannual review report, but let me quickly take you through the biannual review process. As mentioned by James in this introduction, the CADEP started way back in 2003 and was revigorated in 2014 through what is known as the Malabo Declaration. And by taking the Malabo Declaration, we were tasked, the head of state, we were tasked to monitor the progress that our countries, our member states are making towards achieving the Malabo goals and commitment by 2025. And the first report, the inaugural report, was due in 2018. So the first report was produced in 2018, the second one in 2020, and the third one is the one that we are discussing today that is produced, that is released in 2022, and the last report, we are expecting it to be released in 2026. Next slide, please. The Malabo commitment is, the seven commitments are fully in line with the development agendas, both at continental level, and as you can see, it's linked to the seven aspiration of the continental agenda, that is the agenda 2063, the Africa we want, is linked to the UN Sustainable Development Goal, mainly the goal number two on ending hunger, and also to the UN Food System Summit uh, tax uh, weights. Next slide, please. Now, can, can I go to the next? The Malabo commitment, we have seven commitments. And these seven commitments, I think, we all know about it if we are, to, we are all here today. We have the first one, which is on the commitment to the uh, CADE principles. The second commitment is the commitment to enhancing investment in agriculture. All of us, we, are, we, we record the 10% public investment in agriculture. The third one, which is the ending hunger by 2025. The fourth one on halving poverty by 2025. Boosting the African trade, that is tripling um, South Africa trade by 2025, that is a fifth commitment. The sixth one is about enhancing resilience to climate variability, and the last one is enhancing mutual accountability for action and results. They have been debated on why 2025. As I mentioned at the beginning, the Malabo commitment at Hancock to the Agenda 2063 uh, of the Africa we want, and this agenda, the implementation of this agenda has been sequenced. And the first 10 years implementation plans end in 2025. That is why you will see most of these commitments made are to 2025. Next slide, please. Now, the biannual review uh, process is a process that is evidence-based and it is peer-driven. This is a self-reporting uh, uh, scheme that aims at evaluating the country's performance towards achieving the CADEP Malabo goals and target. So it is the data that are collected by countries, submitted by countries through the regional economic communities, and then to the African Union, and the African Union role is to compile the report and submit to the member states. The inaugural report had seven thematic areas that are linked to the seventh commitment, 23 performance category and 43 indicators. For those of us who were at the beginning, we had a, more than 100 indicators at the beginning and through an interactive discussion, we agreed to have 43 indicators that could really explain or speak to the agricultural transformation on the continent. The second during the second uh, cycle, 
we added one performance category and four indicators. And during the last biannual review, we added two more indicators. And this simply shows the importance as time goes of reporting to the biannual review report, as you will see in the following slides. Next. Now, in terms of report that we are receiving from countries, you would see from this slide that there is also a lot of efforts that have been made to have all our member states reporting. The, during the first biannual review report, we have eight member states that did not report. During the second, six member states do not report. We four newly, the member states that report the first time. And during the last one, we only have four. Our aim is to have all the 55 EU member states reporting to uh, the Banoia Review Report. And this is uh, a, an indication of the interest at country level to really report on the progress that member states are making towards the Malabo commitment. Next slide, please. Now, once you have the report, in order to read and understand the report, we have, we, are, we use some terminology that would be important for all of us to understand. The, the first one is the benchmark. The benchmark is the minimum score that a member state should have to be on track to achieve the Malabo target. And the benchmark is a moving benchmark. In 20, it, during the first biannual review report, the inaugural one, we have a benchmark at 3.994. During the second one, it was at 6.66. And the last one, the benchmark was at 7.28. Again, because the third biannual review report was produced, midway to the Malabo commitment, we introduce a new terminology. So if you are below the benchmark, you are not on track. That is what we call not on track. If you are above the benchmark, you are on track. And if you are between five and the benchmark, below the benchmark, but above five, you are in the category that we call progressing well. So these are, this is an innovation that we had for the third biannual review report, simply because this report was produced midway to 2025. Next slide, three, please. In a more visual way, this is how we present the scores. The scores are presented in what we call the, agriculture, the Africa Agricultural Transformation Scorecard. It is a card that shows you First, the scores that each country has obtained during the uh, assessment period, the review period. Second, whether the country is on track or not, and the country on track has a green color. If the country is not in, on track, you have the red color. And for the countries that are progressing well, you have the blue color. And in the uh, scorecard, you have some arrows. That shows the progress that the countries have done in between the two, two reviews, the previous review and the current one. If the arrow looks up, then it is a progress, an improvement from the last review. If it looks down, it is a regression. And the stage change is also shown in the scorecard. So you have a percent of this scorecard. It tells you exactly as a country or as a stakeholder how your country or a country or a region has performed on, during the biannual review uh, cycle. Next slide, please. I, I will not go into the details of the, the, the progress that the continent has done, but when you look at this map, you could see that basically during the third biannual review cycle, only one country was on track. This on track and this country is Rwanda. 19 countries are progressing well and 31 countries are not on track. The continent as a whole is not on track despite the fact that there is an improvement from the last 
uh, cycle. The continent is not at, on track, and this is worrisome. I think we are discussing policy implications today, and this is really be something that we look at. How do we, what are the policy implications of this? We are almost three years to 2025. The continent is not on track. The figures on hunger and malnutrition are on the rise. What do we do to change the situation? Next slide, please. In order to increase the utility of the BR report, because the BR report is not only produced to uh, monitor the progress, but the main objective of the BR report is also to inform uh, planning, to inform discussion at country level. The, the third biannual review report did have an innovation, which is the use of the data that has been collected for the BR to report on the progress that we are making as a continent on the implementation on the AU decisions related to agricultural transformation. So you will have in this report a full chapter that provides a report, a detailed report using the BER data on how the continent is implementing the decisions taken by our leaders. We have basically nine uh, uh, decisions that are being captured in this report. Moreover, because the report was prepared during just after the UN Food System uh, Summit, we also look at the indicators that are in the report and trying to align or classify these indicators according to the UN Food System Action Tax to also judge how countries are performing along these action tax. Next slide, please. Now, I'm sure we'll, uh, the organizer will share with you the link to the report where you have, you can play with the report and the figures that and the graphs that I've just uh, shown you. And this is done through what we call the PR communication toolkit. The, the, the link is here. Feel free to use this link for to, to check how your country is performing, to compare your country with the neighboring country, to compare region. And it's really an interactive tool, and I really encourage you to, to do that. Now, as I did mention, and this would be the, the next slide. As, the, as I did mention, the BR report should be used as a foundation to transform agricultural transformation in, agriculture, uh, in Africa. And to this end, there are some key recommendations that are made to this end. The, the first one is the need to mount a strong communication and dissemination campaign on the findings of the report. And I think this event is really in line with this recommendation. The, the second one is really to use the Cadet Biennial Review uh, uh, Communication Toolkit and the dashboard to, among the stakeholders, to engage stakeholders at country level, to engage stakeholders at regional level for action to happen. And to this, we are re really requesting stakeholders at national and regional level to use this report to convene national dialogue, to prioritize and develop policies based on the recommendations that are in the biannual review report. Next slide, please. We also call for a strong political leadership and commitment to mobilize stakeholder buy-in for financing and implementation of the recommendations of the biannual review report. This is very important. As we often said here at the Commission, if member states have implemented, were implemented the uh, CADEP uh, Malabo, all the shocks that we are facing today may not have had the impact that they are having on our ag agricultural sector. There is a need at country level to have a central coordination mechanism for the effective implementation of CADEP. CADEP embraces a food system approach. It's not a one sector approach. CADEP is a multi sector approach, so we need to have this coordination at national level in order to advance the implementation of CADEP. And lastly, 
we need to develop Malabo compliant uh, 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 natural agriculture investment plan. This has been said by the previous speakers. Some countries have embraced uh, CADEP, others are still lagging behind. There is a need to have all the countries embracing Mal uh, the CADEP and the Malabo commitment. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Simplice. What um, a rich uh, presentation. Really, um, congratulations to Africa as a continent for progressing on its uh, biennial review scores over the past two years, despite numerous challenges related to COVID, related to supply, supply change, related to climate events, related to locusts, et cetera. Um, and I'm sure we'll we uh, certainly USAID, and I'm sure the audience will be interested in, in uh, further discussion on those recommendations about how we can help countries advance more quickly in the forthcoming years. I'd now like to turn it over to uh, two presenters from uh, Academia 2063 and IFPRI, who are going to talk about the CADAP biennial review use cases. So, Dr. Augustin Wambo Yamjeo and Dr. Sam Benin. So um, Augustin is the Director of Knowledge Systems at Academia 2063. He has previously served, I think, uh, in two different occasions with NAPAD uh, in the African Union Commission's office uh, and still works very closely with the African Union Commission in terms of support for their activities. Dr. Sam Benin is uh, a Deputy Division Director at the International Food Policy Research Institute. Uh, I believe, Sam, you have a joint uh, operating agreement of a sort with academia so that you provide some support for academia. And of course, um, before academia evolved from uh, IFPRI to a standalone African institution, you were uh, very, very closely involved in all of the work that was done through IFPRI's uh, Africa Department including much of the early work on the development of the indicators for the biennial review. So two fantastic experts here to tell us more about the biennial review cases. And Augustin, may I turn it over to you first, please? Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, thank you to AgriLinks, uh, USAID for associating Academia 2063 to this interesting uh, webinar. Uh, after following the background presentation provided by Simplice, uh, we were requested, we are now requested to uh, present a few use cases on the policy and programmatic changes as a result of the CADEP Biennial Review. Uh, it's important to look at this because uh, having the report itself is something important, is an important milestone. But uh, what you do with the report is equally important. How do we use the report to get the changes to take shape on the ground? I think it's something of interest. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So in looking at the, these use cases, I considered uh, two uh, components, two aspects. Uh, I look at the BR as a catalyst of investment in agriculture. Uh, in looking at these uh, 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 investments, I consider two dimensions, increments in volume of investment and improvement in investment targeting. If you recall, the commitment about investment is one of the central commitments. Not to mean that is uh, uh, more important than others, but uh, areas where we could really identify concrete policy changes and programmatic changes as a result of BR uh, include the, the component on, on investment. Next slide. So just to take one example, let's look at Benin as a country. The declaration starting back from, uh, from Malabo, from Maputo, uh, was squarely narrowed on the issue of 10% uh, uh, budget commitment to agriculture. When you mention CADEP, for everyone who happens to come across the conversation, 
The first thing that you will learn is uh, the commitment to allocate a minimum of 10% budget to agriculture. Benin as a country was doing not that bad back in 2018, but uh, decided based on the performance that was presented at the release of the Biennial Review report, the first report in that case for that matter, decided to uh, do even more. The country committed more budget to agriculture than before. And we are in a position to establish the, a direct link between the advocacy work that was done by African Union and partners towards getting countries to allocate more resources to agriculture and this decision by the government of Benin. We could see the same uh, uh, with other, other countries like uh, Lesotho, but we can also say the same about Ghana where following the first uh, Biennial Review report, the government demonstrated uh, the commitment to do more and went on to establish quite a few concrete projects and programs to drive investment into agriculture. Next slide. Now, the other aspect that I wanted to look at is uh, still increments in volume of investment by the private sector as a consequence of what the government did to make it possible for more private investment to, uh, to flow into the sector. The government of Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, uh, looking at uh, how the country was underperforming, decided to adopt the investment code in 2018 with a very significant level of tax incentive to all agricultural sector private investment. Uh, this is not to say that uh, nothing would have happened without the BR report. We're just saying that the BR was very instrumental in helping to continue to elevate the advocacy that started back in 2003. So as you engage with the officials from those countries, you are able to see that they were very sensitive to how the country were performing, the particular countries were performing. And on this particular case, the government was uh, in a position to appreciate how critical it was to get the private sector investment uh, going so that they can uh, uh, keep sustain the transformation efforts that were already uh, set in motion. And the tax incentives did not just come uh, out of nowhere. Uh, the decision was based on very uh, uh, convincing arguments put forward by the advocacy work that was done around the BR. When you look at the, the case of Ghana, the increase in public investment have also uh, spurred investment into private sector. As I mentioned earlier, you look at uh, Niger, uh, because the country performed very, uh, uh, was completely off track on the commitment on investment finance in agriculture, the country decided to uh, demonstrate a, 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 I mean to take some very decisive measure by adopting a decree in 2018 creating the Nigerian Agency for the Promotion of the Private Sector Investment and Strategic Project. That was also the occasion for the government to pass an inclusive public-private partnership law in the country. Next. When we look at uh, how the VR has helped to improve the targeting of the investments made by the government, we can consider, let's take just Mozambique as a, as a use case, where the government decided to develop flagship program for youth and women empowerment in agriculture. This is not to suggest that nothing was done in the past targeting youth and women. But this time around, it was clearly uh, uh, illustrated that the government was using the evidence that, was, uh, that filtered through the BR process to inform the type of decision that they were making with some very good uh, analytics supporting uh, policy decision on how to channel the resources to reach a particular target. 
if you look at uh, uh, the government of Guinea, for instance, they decided to uh, work more on making sure that uh, at the local level, the local government is able to operate. Uh, several projects were launched in rural and urban area and municipalities in the Republic. And Eswatini also, as a result of the DR, decided to embrace uh, the CAPEF, which they launched in August 2019, also as a result of what the BR was showing, that for the private sector to perform, the government had to take uh, decisive, uh, deliberate policy measures to allow private investment to, 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 to flow into the sector. Next. Now, we also documented use cases from selected countries in which we look at the BR as a trigger for policy dialogue and evidence-based planning, something that has been alluded, alluded to uh, by the previous speakers. And we look at this issue from two angle, improve, angles, improvement in policy dialogues and improvement in evidence-based planning. Next slide, please. Let's take the case of, uh, of Uganda, for instance where uh, following the release of the report, the CADEP constituencies in the country mounted a strong campaign that resulted into the government decision to increase the share of the agricultural budget in the national budget, meaning the advocacy work that has been uh, presented as a very key component of uh, uh, supporting the food system transformation it's not something that is just being spoken about without any concrete anchorage on the ground. So the constituency took upon themselves to try and press on the government for the government to feel preoccupied by the underperformance of the sector when it comes to the amount of resources being channeled into agriculture. So in a few countries, including Uganda, we see, we, we begin to see concrete uh, changes shaping up thanks to the effort uh, mounted by uh, the constituencies. Uh, when we look at the, the government of Malawi, for instance, the B, we, we, we learned that the BR process has led to increased policy dialogue between the public and private sectors. Uh, there's nothing suggesting that this was not happening. Again, we're trying to show that the BR itself has helped the government uh, or actors in the, in, the, in the agricultural ecosystem at the country level to be exposed to new tools, to new uh, elements to help a campaign for more dialogue among the various parties involved. Next. Now, when it comes to evidence-based, which is uh, one of the turning points when uh, it comes to uh, uh, getting the right decision, taking, using evidence to uh, make uh, policy and investment decision, and so on and so forth. We realize that countries like Botswana, back in the early days of CADEP, were not very uh, excited about the idea of joining the CADEP process. But uh, they still reported on the BR, and the findings of the BR put some pressure on the government, and the government eventually fully embraced the CADE process by initiating the stakeholder consultation and also by agreeing to align, to use evidence base to plan. And the government decided to come up with the National Agriculture Investment Plan using the guidelines that was that's, that that was were made available for for the exercise and with support from African Union the the, the adopted the night in Kenya as well uh, some pressure uh, was also mounting as the BR report was released the government eventually uh, uh, went back to to CADEP and adopted the agricultural sector strategy uh, uh, transformation and growth strategy, transformation strategy, and the uh, National Agricultural Investment Plan. And we are able to link 
this dynamic, this movement in these two countries with the fact that the BR uh, resource were speaking volumes and the government officials were getting increasingly uh, uh, aware of uh, the importance of uh, aligning their effort, of the importance of uh, relying on evidence to make uh, uh, policy and investment decisions. Next. Uh, quickly, if you could, Augustin. Yes. With these few cases, uh, uh, use cases, let me conclude by sharing two or three final remarks with you. It's getting clearer that the BR is an important trigger of useful changes driving agricultural transformation. As I mentioned in the few cases that you saw there, the, the process is really uh, uh, reporting some positive effect in areas of public, private, and government partners' investment. And this suggests that uh, we could leverage the DR and the joint sector review upon, we could leverage upon them to achieve better results. One thing that we also realize is that uh, there is increased utilization of the BR resource uh, that will, in the end, amplify their impact on concrete activities on the ground. But however, mechanisms uh, for sustaining high-level leadership, political participation in the BR dissemination process are very much needed. Uh, for the sake of time, we couldn't uh, go deeper, but these are just a few pointers uh, to let you uh, have a sense of how much the BR findings have been utilized by the countries, government, and by the private sector and all the stakeholders in their advocacy effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Augustin. Uh, very interesting set of actions um, from different countries in response to the BR data. Thank you very much for that. Sam, may I turn it over to you? Sam, are you on mute? Michael, is uh, did Sam get knocked off the the link? Hey Sam, uh, we're not getting any audio from you. Would you mind checking your sources? I see you're using headphones. Now you're on mute. Um, Sam, I know you were uh, on live video and, and live audio before the uh, presentation started. So if there's something quickly we can do, we'll give it, give it another few minutes to click a mute button or something. No, okay. So I think what we should do is uh, turn this over to, to Robert Uma who is going to moderate our panel. We have a fantastic panel. And Sam, when we get you back online, then um, we will give you time to do your presentation at the conclusion of the panel, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, so Robert, could I ask you to jump forward and lead this panel discussion? And then before we go into the Q&A, we'll see if we can't add Sam in as uh, sort of the last panelist in essence. Thank you. Yes, it is uh, very okay with me, Jim, and I hope you can hear me clearly. I hope that we can somehow find some because I'm very interested to hear what he has to say. Um, but I'll move on to the panel, and uh, we have a very interesting panel, one of the best panels that we have had uh, because of the diversity and the experience that they all have. And the way we are going to do this is I'll introduce the panel shortly uh, and very briefly. Uh, for two reasons. We are running short of time, but also they, they have very long CVs and I would not be able to, to go through all, all of that. So I will just introduce them very briefly. 
Uh, but once I'm done with that, I will ask them each an opening question. And in responding to my question, they will have about two to three minutes to also speak more broadly about their institutions and what they are doing regarding DIA. But having done that, we will switch to the questions that we all have. And there's lots and lots of really good questions already uh, that we will try to get to uh, with the help of my panelists, as well as um, uh, the presenters, uh, Dr. Benin and uh, Simplis and Augustine. Um, so uh, I have with me, uh, as I said, a really good panel. Uh, to start off with, we have got uh, Honorable Neema Lugangira, who's a member of parliament in Tanzania and is actually the chair of the Parliamentary Caucus on Food Safety. Um, she, she's also founded several organizations, one of which I'll mention, which is Agri Zamani, which focuses on, on adding value uh, to ending malnutrition efforts in Tanzania. Um, there, there are two uh, real strong priorities that uh, Honorable Lugangira has in the Tanzanian parliament. It's kind of her prioritized personal agendas. And, one of the more important ones uh, in our context is nutrition, including agricultural food systems, but she's also very interested in community health and digital rights. Uh, so welcome to the panel, Honorable Lugangira. Uh, look forward to engaging with you. Then we also have uh, the pleasure to host Providence Mavubi, who is the Director of Industry and Agriculture at the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa. That's COMESA in short. And of course, Providence is a, a, a long experience, more than 16 years in agribusiness, trade, investment promotion, industry development, et cetera, et cetera. She's worked with many, many organizations, both in the private sector as well as government before, including some USAID IPs. Uh, and so it's, it's a real pressure to have somebody like uh, Providence with us who's sitting in a regional economic community that has a, an important role to play in the CADA process. Uh, welcome, Providence. And, and then with us is also Constance Okeke, uh, who's project manager for public finance and agriculture uh, at ActionAid International. Many of you know uh, Constance to be a passionate supporter of CADAP and the BR process, uh, and has been partnering with lots of other non-state actors and civil society organizations to advocate for increased mutual accountability and policy action right from the grassroots level through to the highest levels of the uh, African Union and with governments. Um, so Providence, uh, sorry, Constance, I'm very happy to have you with us as well. Um, I also have Andrew Age Hongs who's uh, from Ghana and is with the, is actually a research fellow at the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research. Um, that's at the University of Ghana. Uh, but he also has a lot of experience, especially in statistics, uh, development research across continents, has lived and worked in several places, including in Tanzania, by the way, and in the UK, um, and has worked in, in, with the World Bank in Washington, D.C. as a consultant uh, in the chief economist's office. Um, so we really look forward to, to, to his contributions. Just to mention that he has some passion in community service and he nurtures younger people uh, in his local church and teaches both graduate and undergraduate courses at the University of uh, Ghana as we speak. So uh, very nice to have you, Andrew, uh, and especially as we are dealing with data-related issues. Last but not least, has already been introduced, uh, Dr. Simplis Nawala, uh, who will also join this panel. He has already spoken to us. And just to remind you, he's the head of Division for Agriculture and Food Security at the African Union, uh, Department of uh, Rural Economy and Agriculture. Actually, now it's, it's a much broader department also dealing with sustainable development and the blue economy. Um, so that's my panel. And I'd like to start with Honorable uh, Lugangira. Very briefly, uh, you are a parliamentarian. You've heard about CADAP. You've engaged with CADAP. And I'm curious, uh, 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 Honorable Lugangira, if you could share with us, from your perspective, uh, some of the implications that you see uh, from this BR report. But I'm, also, I'm particularly keen on knowing, because parliament, at least in my country and in many African countries, parliament 
is where the money is. People say the government should allocate money into agriculture, 10%. That's what CADAP uh, says. But we struggle with that. And if you look at the statistics, we most African countries are not reaching some even less than 1% or less than 2%. Um, what, what can Parliament do to help us achieve this, these targets? Why haven't we achieved them? You are the people that give money. So <laughs> over to you. And you can also you know, take a few minutes to tell us more broadly about your, your work. Um, thank you very much. I'm very fortunate and humbled to be here. As introduced, I'm Nemo Lugangira, Member of Parliament in Tanzania, I, a new MP, about a year and uh, four months old, got into Parliament in November 2020. Uh, prior to being an MP, I was working at an organization called Southern Agriculture Growth Code of Tanzania for about close to five years, heading the policy, policy department there. And through my work at SADGOT, I came to realize that um, areas which were producing the most food were actually the most malnourished, which was very interesting um, you know, finding for me. And my organization's mandate was just focusing on improving um, productivity of agriculture. So the mandate, there was nowhere where there was a link with also advocating for the consumption. So that's what led me to set up the NGO agri Mining Foundation, which were working um, in peripheral reg regions, which oftentimes are forgotten. Um, in the one year and four months that I've been in Parliament, I've managed to start up a, a group, a parliamentary caucus focusing on food safety. Because one thing that I came to realize, a lot of the times when we're talking about nutrition or agriculture, um, we tend not to put as much importance and em emphasis on food safety. Uh, we tend to focus meeting the food safety standards when we're doing exports, but not necessarily the same when where you know the food is to be eaten in, in country. Um, and now to answer your question, yes, certainly it's us parliamentarians um, who pass the different budgets. Tanzania is just like Kenya, and we're actually in the middle of our parliamentary budget session right now, which will end um, 30th of June, if I'm not mistaken. Um, now, as a parliamentarian, obviously each each MP has got their personal interests, their constituency needs, and as you can imagine, a country like Tanzania, it's a big country, 60 million plus or close to uh, people. You know, we have the health sector, so we have needs of the health sector. You have water, environment, so all these other sectors they also need money, and money is not enough. And as you know, most most governments also depend on development partners and different kinds of donor funding. Now, what I can say is our role as parliamentarians is critical, but for us to be well informed and well capacitated to understand that and do our part, I think it's very important when we're having um, the different discussions, for example, CADEP discussions um, or agricultural development discussions, parliamentarians should also be at the table. Um, unfortunately, oftentimes, you know, um, events get organized and such discussions are, are discussed, uh, commitments are made, uh, call of action is made, but then you find at the end of the day exactly like what you've said, at the end of the day, whether we succeed or not, we need parliamentarians who are actually not on board, uh, who are not part of the process. So we don't understand how did we even get to the 10%. How was that measured to reach the 10%? And how can, how myself as a parliamentarian, how can I prioritize and advocate uh, within the government's small budget that reduce the health sector budget or water budget and put on the agricultural budget? So those are the kind of things that I feel that we have the responsibility, but it has not been recognized to the point that we get capacitated, one, to be able to do that uh, properly, but two, to also participate in the discussions that determine um, these commitments. Um, so that's what that's what I can say. Okay. Yeah. Answer that question. Yeah. Now I hear you. Thanks, and we'll come back to this point hopefully later if we have time. And also, how can we really work with you to get other parliamentarians? Because this this really needs to be done. Um, let me move from parliament in Tanzania to a bigger picture in Comesa, and we've got with us Providence. 
And I wonder, Providence, you, you've been part of this process. You've seen how it's gone. You're, we have this latest report. And the question that I have for you is, are you seeing some immediate policy implications of what this report is saying from Comesa's standpoint with all the countries that you are responsible for? And, and if so, what is Comesa doing to address uh, the challenges, the, the implications of this report, what needs to be addressed? Over to you. Thank you, Robert, for the introduction and also for giving me the floor. Uh, since you are having a very wide audience, uh, allow me to give a brief background about uh, what is Comesa and what we do. Comesa is uh, one of the eight uh, regional economic community recognized by the African Union. Uh, a, member, a membership based organization covering 21 member states. In the recent uh, concluded uh, third uh, biennial review report, 19 of our member states reported, but only one of the member states, which is Rwanda, is on track. 10 of them are on positive trajectory, where, which was uh, recorded as a pro progressing well, but we still have uh, about uh, 10 more who need support. So how we have been involved in the past uh, in this process, uh, as uh, you heard from uh, Dr. Simplis, the binary review is a, a safe reporting exercise. Does uh, regional community, we play a central role in it because data are gathered at the membership level, at the country level, and through us, uh, the data is submitted to the African Union. So in collaboration uh, with the African Union, uh, in order to advance the CADAP Marabo implementation, we have been uh, supporting our member states in reporting process one, and also in organizing and conducting various technical training needed for the CADAP, uh, on the CADAP reporting tools, as well as the CADAP communication tool. We have assisted the, some of our member states to get access to technical and financial resources needed to facilitate data co correction and compilation, as well conduct a technical review on the country CADAP data report. We have also participated in the validation of the data at the regional level and also making follow up to the member state to submit data on time. Uh, recently, we, in collaboration with the African Union, the Department of Agriculture, Rural and Brew Economy, and ADAREX, we conducted a training of the CADAP Binary Review Regional Expert, who will support the post third CADAP Binary Review as well as the fourth CADAP Binary Review process. So, coming back to the question you ask, what are the critical policy that seem to emerge from this? Had the binary review report. Considering that the whole continent we are not on track, one of the key policies that may come out from this is we need to enhance resiliency of our resiliency and sustainable food system in the continent to address the impact of climate and related shock on agriculture and food system. Secondly, we have seen how the COVID-19 and as well the different uh, shocks that are happening, whether it is climate or uh, pest disease, or even the war that uh, the world is facing right now, the, there is a need for country to put policy in place to enhance the social safety and net, social safety net and protection in the con in the context of the shock and emergency to improve on food and nutrition security and the livelihood of most of the vulnerable segment of the population. Third, we need to really strengthen the policy on opening intra-regional trade and utilizing structured market to boost intra-Africa trade in agricultural commodity and services. As much we may be producing, if we are not able to trade within ourselves, we will not be able to address the issue of food security and nutrition. Also, the fourth policy, which really, which was there, but we need to really work on it in a more structured way. How do we increase the public and private investment in the agriculture sector? 
in a more structured way, not just saying it globally. As you heard from our previous speaker, the Honorable MP from Tanzania, our MP needs to understand where is the money needed? Where, where do we need to put money to trigger the desired impact? For example, if you say agriculture, investment in agriculture, where exactly in order to address food security? Is it in research? Is it the ministry need more ex, uh, extension office? Do we need to de-risk de the agriculture sector? Even when we are talking to our development partners, such as USAID, the EU, where do we want them to support us? So member states, after seeing this report, need again to go and on the drawing board and say, where do we invest? Where do we need to invest to trigger the desired effect? And uh, lastly, we need to enhance the data quality to improve decision making. Again, people will not make a decision if they don't have data. This includes public and private investment in agriculture and agri-food system. Uh, lastly, you ask, what are we doing as a regional economic community to, to, uh, to, or to address those uh, uh, critical emerging policy issues? One, as a regional community, we have started to strengthen of regional agri data food system through the development of regional food balance sheet. We believe that this can be a tool that can inform decision maker where the support is needed. Where do we need to transfer goods from one country to another? We are also working hard to really increase our intra-trade through capacity building of member states, especially to address issue on SPS and the food safety issue in order to enhance the regional competitiveness and the access to market for the agri-food and commodity. We are also working to support member states to develop and implement CADAP Malabo compliant high quality national agriculture investment plan. This will guide where to put the money. We are also preparing policy brief to support decision making to drive government and stakeholder buy-in for the financing and implementation of the key BR recommendation. Lastly, we are promoting climate smart agriculture practices because we, are, we cannot shy away that climate change is real and is affecting the food system. And we are also developing regional framework to create more conducive environment to enhance private sector and donor investment in the agriculture sector. I thank you. I want to get more questions. Thank you, thank you very but much. You know, I could feel the passion with which you are looking at these issues coming through to where I am. And I say, oh my goodness, I wish you have got another 30 minutes for her to just talk to us about what needs to be done. And, and one more thing. I think putting you and Honorable Lugangira in the same room could be a really good idea because then she will be getting the points that she needs to go to Parliament with to make sure more money is allocated to the issue. Please do organize. I'm ready to support that. <laughs> yes. And I'm also glad that you talked about resilience, particularly to, to shocks, including COVID. But now we have got this uh, war in Russia. And one of the comments that came from Ms. Alexius Butler's uh, uh, opening remarks is how the impact of Russia's war on Ukraine. We are feeling it in Africa, and 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 that uh, and that that that's something that we I, I believe you know your your suggestion about us focusing on how we deal with this this uh, this kind of shocks is, is very useful. Yeah. So um, we we are having. Uh, an issue with time, so I will urge subsequent uh, speakers to be a bit more uh, brief in terms of their, their input. And I'd like to, to shift gears and talk to somebody who's not in government, uh, but is very much in this system, in the non-state actor space, and that's Constance uh, Okeke. And Constance, as a non-state actor or representative of non-state actor, what is it, very briefly, that you are seeing as the most critical uh, message from the BR report, and what are you doing? You remember, this report is not just for public sector to implement. The, the CADAP is for everybody, private sector, non-state actors. But we, you, you guys seem to be missing. So what, what's, what's action aid? What are non-state actors in general doing uh, to help us implement these things? 
Okay, thank you, Robert, for giving me the audience. Uh, I would like to start off first by um, talking about Action Aid. Um, it's a global federation that works closely. In a minute, students. if you can. <laughs> yeah, civil society organizations and social movements. And our aim is to empower people living in poverty and exclusion to fight for women's rights, social justice, and to end poverty. And in Action Aid, we support people to use their own power to bring about the real change for themselves, and they, that includes women, communities, and societies. And we're presently in 46 countries, 19 of which uh, is within Africa. Um, and back to your question, um, I do not think it's right to say that uh, the civil society not actually is missing, because over the course of the Bayama review process, we've been part of this process, um, collaborating and ensuring that um, we're supporting the implementation of CADEP, and through our consistency in engaging in different advocacy um, uh, spaces to, to, to make sure that the issues that are being brought up by the BR is amplified and engaged with at the national level and also at the, at the regional level. And as non-state actors, um, we want to believe that this report uh, provides governments with the unique opportunity they need to take stock of their progress in agricultural transformation. But you know, looking at the results, uh, being that this is the third process, and all are agreeing that we are not on track, though there is a lot of progress in place, um, it shows that uh, we have a whole lot to do to ensure that we'll achieve our 2025 Malabo Declaration goals. Um, we also believe that we, we know that our economies in Africa depend largely on agriculture. So there is need for that political uh, uh, um, commitment, just like simply said, and the quality of investment that we put into the agricultural sector is definitely going to be key in helping us push on uh, the different kinds of shocks like the COVID and some other uh, issues like climate change and the rest that is bedeviling this particular uh, sector. But there is one key uh, major players within this sector that uh, we cannot overlook, and that is the women. The women that are at the forefront of the food production. And, and so um, the need to redress gender inequality would help us towards the aim to fighting hunger, poverty, and malnutrition, and also promoting our uh, economic growth. So if we say we want to achieve our declarations by 2025, we need to begin to put in our money where our mind is, or our mouth where our food is. We, could not, we cannot be saying we want to achieve our goals when we are not investing in agriculture. I mean, if we say 10% at least, Let's not even do 10%. Let's, at least across the 55 countries in Africa, maintain at least 5% and then increasingly, you know, move it over the period of time and see whether we will not have results. All the seven areas of commitment in the Malabo are all dependent on the investments we decide to put into agriculture. We've talked about issues of the climate change. We've talked about, I've talked about issues of how you know, the resilience factors are affecting smallholder farmers. What are we doing? How are we ensuring that we are preparing farmers to be able to you know, face up to these challenges? How are we ensuring that the farmers are prepared and, and, and they are being given enough uh, support to, to adapt to some of these climate changes and then also uh, practice things like agroecology, Oh, oh, I am losing Constance. I wonder if, if that's the case for everybody else. Yeah. Um, she... Yes, I well, cannot hear her. All right. Too bad we lost her. She was just getting into the mix in a deep way. Uh, but, you know, be that as it may, I'm going to shift to um, our last speaker, uh, somebody else on the panel. Um, that's Andrew. Uh, who's coming to us from, I believe you must be currently in, in Ghana, if I'm not wrong. And uh, there, there have been a lot of questions. I, I'm not too sure you've been that deeply involved in the process for the BR, but we have a lot of questions about data quality. And this is also something that we'd be interested in hearing what, uh, what, what Sam has to say about how we improve data quality. Uh, but over to you, uh, Andrew Gay Holmes. Uh, you just looking at this with perhaps fresh eyes. 
uh, what's your take on the process and particularly uh, any take home messages that you have for us in terms of what this is bringing to you? And if you could comment about data and how we can improve the quality. Over to you, Andrew. And, and sorry to jump in, but Robert and Andrew, if we could go very quickly and then very quickly, we're just going to give Sam just uh, a couple minutes afterwards and then we're going to uh, try to move to closing remarks by uh, 10.50 Eastern time or uh, about nine minutes from now. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Oh my goodness, Jim, we've got a very short time. Over to you, Andrew. So I make three quick points. Um, very interesting to uh, note that the previous report suggested that four countries were on track. Today we have just one country on track. Primarily, I think we are all not unaware of what COVID might have caused. But I think that it will be interesting for other countries to take a critical look at what uh, Rwanda is doing and learn some of the lessons. Obviously, um, I'm sure many countries have this team and they want to get something done. But uh, it surprises everybody that in hard times, at least one, one country stood the test of time and it will be interesting to learn from them. About data, currently what my institute is doing is to, first of all, use, for instance, data from um, well-known sources like uh, FAO to address specific questions on some of uh, these commitments. So if you think about hunger, one of the areas is post-harvest losses and food storage. So what we did was to gather data from existing sources and primarily develop uh, some analysis for food storage. You hand it over to the countries or the country representatives and they feel that the data is far from the truth. So the question is, how do we encourage countries to put forward what data they believe to be correct? And I think one step to do so is to build bridges and encourage them to always be prepared to release what they believe to be the right data. Okay. And I think it's an important step. And for researchers who use secondary data, it's also always good to try and go to in-country and speak to those who matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'll try to go through a few questions. We've got only seven minutes by my clock before we have to shift to some. So I'll start with you, Sim, please. You explained that there's a new measurement category called progressing well. Uh, and, and countries could be in this category even though they could be below the benchmark. Could you just say in 30 seconds why uh, this category was developed and its significance? That's a question from uh, our chat box. I'm just going to go through the questions we're receiving from our listeners. No, very, very quick, man. Uh, as I did mention, the third by BIR report was produced at midway to um, the Malabo 2025 target. And if you look at the benchmark, the benchmark is not a linear benchmark. It's like an exponential benchmark. So if it was a linear benchmark, midway, countries to be on track would have been at five. But because it is not a linear benchmark, we thought we could use that five mark to see, to check whether countries are progressing well towards the Malabo commitment. So that is basically the, the answer of the countries progressing well. Yeah. And simply, so while I have you, somebody, Maleshoane Kolisan, I believe from Southern Africa, is asking, you know, are the reports that country, the, the reports, the evidence, basically, the, the, of this data before it is submitted, the, the, the reports at country level, are they public so that people can go and see that and see whether the data is credible? Yes, the process, I, the process is quite an elaborate one. I've seen many questions. We invite stakeholders to be part of the BR process at country level because there is a data validation a mm -hmm. process at country level where the data is checked by all stakeholders before submitted to the regional economic communities. So there is a sense of confidence that the data 
that are submitted are corrected at the correct data if the validation process have been inclusive as we have requested it to be. So please, all the stakeholders at national level should be part of the process, should be part of the validation process to ensure that the data that is submitted are correct data. Thank you very much, Tim. Please, there is a question, and I'm going to throw this question perhaps to Andrew, given his interest in youth engagement. And the question is from Derek Ekanem, who's wondering, you know, given the importance of evidence-based data generation and so on, are there opportunities for us to engage youth in this particular work so that they are also engaged in transforming um, African food, food systems? Uh, do you see an opportunity here? You teach at the university that I believe there are young people there <laughs> and, and around you in general in this general data gathering and ground truthing and checking and cleaning processes. Well, obviously, th there is, and uh, there are three angles one from the field, young people in technology development, and, and finally, um, economists or agri economists or data scientists who can come in. But I'm more uh, interested in those young people who have taken agribusiness as uh, their uh, concern in the fields. They are people who are working with processes. They are people who are working with trans transporters. And we could engage them through development of apps and collect data from these people they work with to feed into um, the qualitative versions of what we do. So I believe that we need to include them and imprint in them the need for such data, because of course they are going to take over from us and uh, uh, push it forward. So yes, training for them, involving them, and also making them understand that it is something that is for them because the future belongs to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate that very much. I'd like to come back to uh, Neema and as well, uh, I don't know if Constance is back, <laughs> but you know, this challenge that we now have of a lot of priorities, there's so many priorities. Look at the, the there's limited amounts of money. There are several questions about this. You know, we have so many challenges. There's now pressure on prices and so on. Uh, and Constance even said, that we should put our money where our food is. That was our exact statement. How can you help us understand, just listening to all of this, say a little bit more about how we can prioritize investment in agriculture? Uh, is there, so far from what you're listening to, any quick idea on this? And I've got just about 30 seconds for you. Um, thank you very much. What, what, what I can just say is, in most of our African countries, the agriculture contributes to you know, 27, 30, et cetera, percent of the GDP. So there's, there's money that is generated from the agricultural sector itself. Um, maybe it is also time to, to explore at, at the in-country um, how we do reinvestment in the agricultural sector. So for example, for a country like Tanzania or Kenya, um, Nigeria, whichever country, if you're generating, if you get one million shillings from agriculture, let's say in a certain council, how, what percentage of that one million should the council reinvest back into, into developing the agriculture sector? So for example, here in Tanzania, there is an act which, a local government financial act that states that um, every council is supposed to reinvest 10% of the revenue generated from, no, I think it's 20% of the revenue generated from the agricultural sector to be reinvested back to agriculture. 15% reinvested back to livestock, 5% reinvested back to fishery. So what I can say is perhaps there's something there that we can work with to see how did Tanzania come up with that. But now the other issue is how to implement it. Because once the money is collected by the council, they, 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 they already decide other, they have other plans of how to use the money. So how to make sure that it is actually enforceable. So that's what I can say in the time, in the time given I'm giving to me, but certainly, thank, yeah. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Robert. I'd like to thank the panel. What a fantastic set of, of remarks and comments. We would love to have you for the entire day. Uh, unfortunately, we, we can't, we do have to close. 
Sam, I'm going to ask you, um, just in the interest of time, just to give us your two top takeaways. I, I don't think you're going to have time to go through your slide deck. Uh, two minutes, please. Two minutes only. Thank you, Sam. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, the main um, thing that I was tasked with is um, to what extent have member states heeded the call for strengthening agricultural data systems and what needs to be strengthened going forward? If we think about the context of going from data to policy, uh, policy action. So I'll try to make my main um, uh, takeaways looking at it from the perspective of the data that has been submitted in terms of the quality of the data and some of the challenges and how to, 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 to address that. So overall, um, data has improved, but we see that there are some severe um, um, quality um, 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 issues that remain. So you can see that from the first BR to the third BR, there's proportion of the data in terms of the variables that countries have to report and have increased, right? And this is due to several things that have been happening um, by introducing the EBR, restricting countries, on the data um, parameters that they can enter based on um, um, evidence and also the likely um, um, ranges of, of, of the data. Data um, validation at the country level, which you can see already, um, is going on in the chat. But there are quality issues which have, which have um, persisted. So I use this example of the RGDP growth rate, for example. I like this, um, this example because the RGDP information is used in several um, aspects of the the, of the indicators that are tracked. And then you can see that there are many countries that face that um, the issues are, are in. For example, if you add the parts of um, the subsectors, crops, livestock, forestry, fishery, they are greater than the total that is reported. So that's an already issue. Usually the growth rate is measured in constant um, value terms. The deflator has issues. So for example, some countries have negative deflators. So if you, if yeah, you do I'm that, sorry. then already, you, I'm sorry to cut yeah, you off, Jim, I'm but, but we don't, we really don't have time to go into that level of detail. So yeah, what, Jim, I'm getting to 10 it. 10 seconds. I'm, I'm getting to it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so from, from that perspective, then what we have to see is that there are frustration in the country perspective in terms of how to improve the data. So what to do is to train on the data issues and also get the countries to buy into the idea that the data that is being submitted is actually being used to analyze things that help them to take policy action. Next slide, please. And so the, 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 the data itself is now being used mostly for accountability, which is good, but there are, there are some restrictions in there if we want to look at policy action. So for example, we need to actually look at the the indicators themselves, the value of the indicators to analyze relationships across the indicators, you know, look at how the policy variables in the BR are actually impacting the outcomes variables in the BR, like nutrition, um, growth rates, et cetera. Because this is what now allows you to be able to make some firm policy recommendations. But the BR itself, sort of the, the scores restrict them. So you cannot really use the scores to make um, policy recommendations as, as it is. So one of the things that we're working on, um, next slide please, one of the things that we're working on to support this process is to um, use some of the work that we have done in the past to build um, sort of a decision support tool that evaluates alternative policy actions, like the, the last speaker, for example, was talking about looking at investments in agriculture. If you think about it overall, agriculture is one component that can help you reach some of the key indicators like um, 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 nutrition, etc. So increasing investment in agriculture definitely reduces investment in other things that contribute to nutrition. So you need to evaluate all of these, look at the trade-offs to help you do that. And so, um, and then that yeah, helps. Thank, to, thank to, you very to, much. I'm to, sorry. To, I, to I, I really do apologize. I really do apologize, Sam. I, I encourage people to reach out to Sam to learn more about this decision support tool. But uh, we do have one more speaker, and so I want to, um, I, I apologize, Sam, I want to close your remarks here, and then uh, I want to turn it over for closing remarks to the Ethiopia Mission Director, 
and the former senior deputy assistant director to Feed the Future and the Bureau for Res uh, Resilience and Food Security in Washington, uh, Sean Jones. Sean, may I turn it over to you, please? Well, thank you very much, Jim. And I'm so sorry, Sam, that I'm the one to have to uh, butt in here, cut you off. Listening intently to you. Um, and uh, from Addis Ababa, it's really a pleasure to have an opportunity to, to talk with you all uh, this, this afternoon, this morning, this evening, wherever you might be. Um, and I really appreciate how the distinguished panel uh, that we heard from today are all leading Africa's agricultural development agenda, truly. And their contributions are actually helping to complement our own understanding of the valuable results that are coming from the CADEP research, engagement, and follow-up processes. Um, CADEP, of course, uh, the, bienn the biennial review um, stemming from the 2014 uh, Malibu Declaration is, is more than just a report, as we all know. It's a story of collaboration uh, to improve the food security of Africa's 50 million citizens and residents. But it also serves to galvanize us and to focus our efforts uh, and to spot, inspire others uh, to join in that, in that journey. And I also appreciate the focus of the report, which of course aims to support the evidence-based reflection of all of our agricultural development efforts. But in critically and importantly, it also serves as a, um, as a sense, it's, and it's, it is sensitive to ensuring that all of us are cognizant of the need to be to, to implement adaptively or to have adaptive implementation as part of our agenda. And that, as Robert mentioned earlier, uh, it's actually absolutely critical during this period of time uh, when we have multiple conflicts, multiple wars and climate shocks that are occurring uh, that are affecting all of our food systems. But we must not, of course, equate adaptive approaches to relaxing our own targets and relaxing the targets that our African partners have. This year, of course, will introduce or amplify the impact of climate conflict shocks on our food, system, food security or global food security and the global food system that we haven't actually seen since probably 2008 and maybe even worse in some regards. Now is the time to double down on our own commitment to those reforms that are truly transformative in nature. And so, we might ask ourselves, what's USAID's role in? I will come back to you immediately and say that USAID is just another partner of the African people, of the African continent and all of the countries and peoples and nations that make up Africa. And we as America, we have a commitment to supporting the African Union Commission's efforts towards even greater inclusivity, transparency, and mutual accountability. And as a partner, we're also investing in Africa. Africa's successes are America's successes. But it also means that our children on every single continent will be healthier and more prosperous because of the U.S. investments in Africa. One such investment, of course, is, is our support for the Biennial Review, which is a powerful tool for data-driven policy change and a signature example of USAID's gained engagement with our African partners. And, but at the same time, these are just investments. But as investments, uh, as it is in the, in the case of the, of the BR, we're also investing, but we expect a return. We expect greater uptake in the biennial review results and the, and the findings. We're all challenged, particularly at this time, as I've already stated, we're all challenged by the difficulty of implementing the recommendations that are coming out of the, the, our, our research and our findings. But as, as Dr. Nuala already mentioned earlier, there, there are challenges, but there are also an amazing number of successes that are coming as well. So collectively, we must be very clear-eyed and, and look at the report's reach and how to extend it. Hearing from some of Africa's leading voices today in the agricultural development space, from parliamentarians to activists to researchers and representatives of regional economic blocs, it's important as a first step towards implementation, towards, uh, the, towards this end. Accountability, of course, of all of our commitments is fundamental to shared progress. And I mean all of our commitments, the, the developing uh, countries, but also the countries that are, that are providing support to our African brothers and sisters. 
And so through U.S. investments and in partnerships in food systems, resiliency, productivity, nutrition and diversity of food and markets, we will advocate for continued action led by local leaders that will include the role of the private sector, civil society and academia in policy formulation. Let me just turn really briefly to Ethiopia. Uh, and in addition to doing all those things I just listed, our USAID program in Ethiopia has even pivoted some parts of our approach and we're seeking every opportunity to bring those actors to the decision-making table as advocates for change, not just about government. It's about cha change coming from an ecosystem, which includes the private sector, government, civil society, and others. And here in Ethiopia, we're also investing in leadership. We have plans to support the creation of a leader, Ethiopian Leadership Institute, which is not a project, which USAID is very known for. It's not projectized. It is an institution that will be there forever, that will focus every day on building local capacity, local leadership, utilizing data and information, bringing world-class capabilities and capacities uh, to the leadership spectrum, and of course, bringing multi-sectoral diverse networks uh, uh, at their disposal to lead uh, various reform efforts throughout the country. And last but not least, the U.S. government remains fully committed to the leadership of the African Union, our brothers and sisters that are just down the street from my current location, and the efforts that they and their member nations do every day to advance their economies and agricultural systems. So in closing, I just want to celebrate the African Union Commission's launch of the third biennial review report. I call on the people and institutions that are associated with this effort to devote the resources that are necessary to help ensure its impact. And I want to also give significant thanks to the participants um, uh, of this CADAP review process in the BR uh, for this opportunity to learn together. I encourage all the participants to visit the AgriLinks website uh, that all of us invested, not just USA, but all of us invested so much time and energy to develop uh, and the resources that are in that system and express a deep desire for continued engagement in the years ahead. Thank you, Jim, and thank you to all the participants and all of the colleagues online. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Very poignant remarks. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate all the remarks from all the participants the questions and interaction from all of the audience, your attention uh, with this really, really great webinar. We will make uh, slides and um, an edited recording available, I believe. Michael, can you confirm that, please? Yes, that's right. And so stay tuned on AgriLinks, and we will um, uh, provide additional information uh, from the, the slides and the recording. And thank you all. We are adjourned. What a fantastic meeting.